Good morning, and thank you so much for joining today's Power Hour series. My name is Sue Bernardin, and I'm the Associate Director of Gift Planning at St. John's University, alongside Susan Damiani. As you may know, the Power Hour series is brought to you by the McAllen Society. This series explores a diverse range of topics from art and lifestyle to estate and financial planning to fitness and health and travel food and more. So there's something for everyone. Today, I have the honor of introducing a, uh, a former speaker, Jason Antos, who's the executive director of the Queens Historical Society. Jason is going to explore the history of the Queens Historical Society, which has served the Queens community since 1968. Pretty cool. So a little bit about Jason. Uh, Jason was born in Flushing, so he's a Queens native and has authored several books on local history. Um, he's authored um, several of the titles released are by Arcadia Publishing, including Images of America, Whitestone, Images of Baseball, Shea Stadium, which we have a great talk um, with Jason from this past April. So if you have a chance, go check it out. Uh, then and Now, Queens, Then and Now, Flushing, Images of America, Jackson Heights, and Images of America, Corona. Um, Jason is a graduate of the University of Miami. Uh, with a master's in communications. And from 2009 to 2020, um, Jason worked as a reporter and was part of the City Press Corp. And in 2007, he joined the Queens Historical Society where he volunteered for several years until um, he became board of directors as VP of operations. And now he is the executive director. So we are so honored to have Jason here with us today and I'm gonna let him take it away. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Stu, I appreciate that. And thanks for having me back again. I really enjoyed the last talk on Shea Stadium with uh, some good stuff. A lot of people enjoyed it. So I'm here again too. I want to welcome everyone to this uh, morning gathering. And um, if you pardon the airplane noise in the background, because uh, we're about a couple miles from LaGuardia Airport and we're in the flight path. So uh, that, that'll happen from time to time. So just pretend you're at Shea Stadium back in the day when, when the planes used to fly over every 10 minutes. Um, but at any rate, so I am the executive director here at Queen's Historical Society. We are the official uh, historical society for the entire borough of Queens. Uh, there are several other historical societies that also serve as Queens County, including the Bayside Historical Society, the Underdunk House, which is in Ridgewood, Queens, Greater Astoria Historical Society, and also the Newtown Historical Society. Uh, but we're the Queens Historical Society. And we operate here in a 300 plus year old uh, homestead uh, called the Kingsland Homestead. And it's located in beautiful downtown Flushing in Weeping Beach Park, uh, right off of Parsons Boulevard, about a block from Northern Boulevard. Uh, we started in 1968, uh, but where our origins go further back than that, we actually started in 1903. And in 1903, we, we began as the Flushing Historical Society uh, we were started by L. Bradford Prince, who was like the mayor of Flushing. And he started this as a, like a community project. The first honorary member of the Flushing Historical Society was President Theodore Roosevelt. And they were in, in uh, activity from 1903 to 1968. And then in 1968, when QHS was founded, um, we absorbed the Flushing Historical Society and their archive and everything and became officially Queens Historical Society. Um, we are in the old Kingsland Homestead, which was located at 155 Northern Boulevard and was moved one mile west to where it is today. It was split in half and moved on a flatbed to this location where we are in Flushing. Um, we also, uh, <clears throat> we do many, we just started up after a year of being closed due to COVID, but that's a typical story with everyone in, um, in this day and age. So we've just uh, revamped our program. Uh, we are doing walking tours. We're gonna have our first Juneteenth celebration on June 20th. And we're gonna be doing a walking tour of downtown Flushing via the Queens Rising project in the last weekend of this month. So I believe around June 20, uh, 26th or 25th, it's gonna be posted uh, by tomorrow on our website, which is queenshistoricalsociety.org. So uh, we have some video, I guess, uh, to you know, give you like a brief tour of the facility uh, that we could look at. If, if we could.
So we, I guess we can start with the first one, Flushing 1853. Yeah, we just go in order like that. So we're going to look at some uh, some photos that were taken from our archive and some video that I shot over the weekend of QHS. So what we're looking at here is a lithograph of downtown Flushing in 1854. That's what, <laughs> that's what downtown Flushing looked like in 1854, looking from College Point Boulevard. So we're standing now on College Point Boulevard looking east. And we see the Flushing Institute, this beautiful building with the colonnades in the right hand side. We see St. George's Church to the left, various farms and rolling hills. And this is what the view uh, uh, was, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, if one was to stand on College Point Boulevard near Roosevelt Avenue in the year 1854. And one of this, one of the things what I like about history is that it's it's another world with people and places and things that you know no longer exist, and there's no barely any trace of it left today except for St. George's Church. So this is a really cool photo. As I mentioned, uh, Kingsland Homestead was moved from its original location because the the city decided to build a shopping center, and it, and in which it did, and in order to uh, you know protect the home, uh, the uh, committee to save Kingsland Homestead and the city purchased the house for $1, all right? I believe it was Mayor uh, Lindsay who uh, brokered the deal. And sure enough, uh, the house was moved as you can see here down Northern Boulevard in two sections, uh, uh, to, much to the shock and awe of onlookers as it, it's moved down Northern Boulevard to the Weeping Beach Park. This is another angle of the house coming down Northern Boulevard. <clears throat> you see a police escort and you see the flap. I mean, it's, it's an amazing feat. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how, you know, they didn't even have to dismantle it and then reassemble it in millions of pieces. Like they just, they just did two sections. So to begin with the King and the Murray family uh, were uh, like flushing royalty, I should say, not royalty, but they were very wealthy uh, landowners here in Flushing. That they and they were in the mercantile business, and they ran uh, two steamships that went up and down the Flushing River. One steamship was called the Flushing, and the other one was called the Star. And these would bring uh, people and goods and services up and down the river and across the Flushing Bay to other parts of Queens. And that was their business. Uh, the King and Murray family married uh, into the Parsons family, also part of the Bound family. So they were one of the founding families of Flushing. 300 years ago. This is a photo of the Kingsland Homestead in its original location where that shopping center would later be built. This photo is from the 1920s. And then 40 years after this photo was taken, it would be moved from this location to its current location in Weeping Beach Park. Okay, let's go to the video. Let's check this out. There you go. So the video, this video shows um, the homestead today. <clears throat> We're right off of 37th Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me, 37th Avenue, 143-35, 37th Avenue, 143-35, 37th Avenue off of, uh, off of Parsons Boulevard. This is the homestead as it looks today. Uh, this is coming into the driveway. And the first thing you see is this beautiful mile marker before there was modern day street signs, these mile markers would be every several miles along the major thoroughfares. This one is from Northern Boulevard where it stood 200 years ago in the late 1800s to show that you were five miles from the center or from the 34th Street Ferry. That's 34th Street in Manhattan. Uh, this is the side of the building. This is our newly renovated porch that was dedicated last year. And we are open currently for tours. We are open on Tuesdays, Saturdays and Sundays from 2.30 to 4.30. And we charge a $5 admission fee or a suggested donation. And if you're interested, we ask you to go to our website to uh, RSVP and to come down and check out the site. This is uh, the garden. Now, one of the cool things about the Queens Historical Society is that we were uh, given a home here in Weeping Beach Park 
and it's called Weeping Beach Park, obviously because of that gigantic weeping beech tree that we're looking at right now. And that, that tree will celebrate 175 years in the fall of this year. So we're looking forward to doing a very big program and uh, everything for this tree and celebration in the, in the months to come. This is the pathway uh, going around the Weeping Beach. So as I mentioned, it's an actual park. And even though the, <clears throat> if the facility, the Queens Historical Society may or may not be open, the park is open seven days a week from sunup till sundown. So people can come to Weeping Beach Park, walk around. Here is a plaque uh, mentioning about the history of the tree. And you can, you can walk around. You can walk around this park. There are beautiful benches in the back. Um, and you can hang out here, uh, you know, take in the sun, enjoy the weather. And this tree, as I mentioned, is 175 years old this year. Um, the trees of Flushing are very famous. Uh, it was the weeping beech tree, the fox oaks, which were across the street. And then there was the cedar of Lebanon tree. Uh, all those trees are now gone. And the weeping beech is the reigning champion as of trees in Flushing that still survives to this very day. This is a view from the back of the house. This shows the garden in the back in the back of the weeping beech tree. It shows the benches where people can come and hang out and enjoy. It's, it's such a beautiful space. It's really tranquil and calm. And it's hard to believe that you're in the middle of downtown Flushing, which is so built up and, and so heavily populated. And, uh, but here's a place that you can come to you know, you know, ease yourself and relax your nerves and calm down and just, you know, and you know, enjoy some peace and quiet for a little while. So the, this again is from the rear of the facility, the Weeping Beach Tree. Now is this, with the weather that's going on right now, is the perfect time to come down here to sit outside and enjoy. And this of course is the, as I mentioned, the rear of the house. So much of the house is original, but there are additional things that were installed, for example, as you can see right now, this is a handicap ramp uh, that was installed in the rear of the facility to provide access to everyone uh, into the Queens, into the Queens Historical Society um, so that people could come and enjoy our programming and tour the facility. So this is the Weeping Beach tree again, um, or part of the Weeping Beach. And, and again, it's hard to believe that you're in downtown Flushing. Uh, the name Flushing, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a Dutch word. It actually comes from the word Vlissingen, which means salt meadow in Dutch. And there's actually a port city in the Netherlands called Vlissingen, uh, V-L-I-S-S-I-N-G, G-E-N, Vlissingen. And that, and so the when the British occupied Flushing or Vlissingen, it was uh, corrupted into the word Flushing because the British could not, could not pronounce the word Vlissingen and they made it into Flushing. This is a pathway that goes all around, uh, all, all around the property um, and uh, goes around the Weeping Beach Tree. It starts from where you enter the facility off of, uh, from the street in the driveway and then circles the entire back of the property around the park, around the Weeping Beach, and then terminates right here in this little garden area here with two beautiful benches, and then provides access back out into the street onto, onto 37th Avenue. Um, this is a great, like I said, I mean, look for, let's see for yourself, look at how beautiful it is and how peaceful it is. Um, and this is a great place to come and relax and visit, as I mentioned, <clears throat> you have to RSVP to come see the Historical Society. You have to contact us prior to coming here. But if you want to come here to enjoy the park, you know, as I mentioned, it's seven days a week from sun up till sundown for Weeping Beach is a, uh, although the house is privately owned, the park that surrounds it is controlled by the New York City Parks Department. And that's why it's open seven days a week 
from sunup to sundown for the public. Free, of course. And I think now we're gonna move into the interior. We saw a lot of the exterior. So here is the New York State uh, historical, the New York City historical plaque that is uh, outside of the main entrance to the Kingsland Homestead. It talks about the building. It talks about when it was constructed. Uh, it was built originally in the late 1700s and has been added on to three times over the past 200, 300 years. That is the original door. And that's what you see when you walk right in. And here we are, we are now inside of the Queens Historical Society. This shows the uh, entryway into the main gallery room. The gallery that we are currently on exhibit is uh, the photographs of Percy Loomis Spear. Uh, it's called Capturing Queens. Uh, this is the gift shop where we have various books and publications on the history of Queens. Uh, for sale here. We are your go-to place for anything historically related to Queens County. Here we move into the gallery. Okay, and these are really cool photos of the, of, uh, from Percy Loomis Spear. Percy Loomis was a photographer who took pictures of the five boroughs from the mid-1920s until just after World War II. He suffered from spinal meningitis, so he did all of these, uh, all of this photo work with a cane. All right, and he was known as the official photographer for New York City, and he would go around the city taking these photos uh, just prior to that area's redevelopment. So these are like the last known photos of that location before it would be turned into uh, an apartment complex or before that property would be turned into to a parkway or an airport, etc. cetera. Um, and so we are lucky enough to own some of the negatives to Percy Loomis Spear and we are going, and that is why we made these beautiful prints and we have this uh, photographic work on display for everyone to come and enjoy. We ask you, we urge you to come down to see this amazing gallery exhibit because it'll be here until September, October, where it will be replaced with another upcoming exhibit. These are some artifacts that we have from him. Uh, this is uh, our conference room where the gallery exhibit continues. Um, this uh, exhibit room or, or gallery room, or, or excuse me, presentation room, I should say, is where you could come to do a lecture talk. This is where we hold our board meetings. Also, the Queens Historical Society is available for rental. We, uh, we provide the space as a rental facility. So you can come here to hold a board meeting. You can come here to have a gathering of uh, up to 35 uh, people. Uh, we do not have in-house catering, but you could bring in your uh, an outside caterer. This weekend, we're actually hosting a graduation party. So we've done small weddings, we've done small reunion parties, graduation parties, birthday parties, et cetera. And we offer the facility at a very, a very affordable hourly rate. So that's another option for people uh, in order to enjoy the Queens Historical Society. Okay, this is a, a little VIP tour of the Inner Sanctum. This is the archive room. This is where we have all of our goodies, all of the great photos and maps and diagrams having to do in papers, having to do with Queen's history. A lot of the stuff in this room dates back to the Revolutionary War, through the Civil War, through the early 20th century and beyond. Um, we have millions of items uh, that are housed here. Um, what you're seeing here is a drum. This is a Civil War drum from the Hamilton Rifle Division, which was the Civil War Brigade, the Civil War Brigade from Flushing that fought uh, in re representing the, the North, representing the Union. And this is the snare drum that they played as they marched into battle. And it was actually created right here in Flushing by Sylvester Rowe, who uh, also in 1866 helped finance the installation of the Civil War Veterans Monument that is now in the, still to this day standing in the middle of Northern Boulevard by Linden Place. So that is the archive room. Uh, we're gonna move on now to 
another room in the house. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this, yeah, this is just a very quick, another take, another angle of the archive room. Uh, these are a lot of the artifacts. We get stuff here sent to us all the time. People find stuff in their attics and they come and they donate all of these things to us here at Queens Historical Society. So these are some of the artifacts that we just obtained. It's these beautiful black and white photos. These are called cabinet photos. Look at the condition they're still in 120 years later. This is, these are photos of Flushing. That what you saw was the Flushing, the College Point Fire Department. That's the Wanata Boat Club, Yacht Club. This is a group photo of the Flushing Post Office right off of Main Street. This is from 1901. And we have all of these rare one of a kind things here for research at Queens Historical Society. So we are your go-to facility for anything related to Queens. So this is a view, this is actually the room that I'm sitting in right now. This is uh, the reading room or the research room. Uh, this is also uh, doubles as my office. Uh, we have more artifacts and research material in here. These are Belcher Hyde uh, engineering maps from the Topographical Bureau of Queens. Uh, these are all of the uh, atlases that were created by the city engineers in the early 20th century when they were laying out the roads and cross streets and parkways when Queens underwent development. This is a map that's right by my uh, desk. This is one of the rarest maps of Flushing. It's from 1841. It's a trustee map, which means it was planned by the village trustees. And there's only two of those in existence. One of them is right here at QHS and the other one is at the Smithsonian Institute. This is the rest of the library of the research room. And like I said, we're open here to have people visit to do research. The research is free, um, but we do charge a, a small commission price to do the, um, to do duplications and reproductions of photos and archival material. I think we have one more video. This is a great video showing, I hope this is, yep, this is our parlor. So this room is the Victorian parlor that shows all of the, uh, this is the furniture that belonged to the family, uh, to the King and Murray family. This parlor was naturally, naturally, naturally located on the first floor. Um, but we moved it upstairs so that we, we, we would have more room for the gallery exhibit. This is their silverware. A lot, some of this stuff is period furniture that was bought to, uh, that's uh, like re reproductions, but things like this, the photos, the writing desk, the armoire, those are all original pieces that belong to the Murray and the King family. Those are their uh, side uh, wheelers or uh, steamships that went up and down the Flushing River. As, as I mentioned, the families were a mercantile family and that is how they made their money. You see the beautiful fireplaces and this is, this is the kind of thing that you see here when you come to QHS. And that's why we urge everyone to come down and, and enjoy the place. That was amazing, Jason. Thanks so much. Thank you. You have a treasure trove of um, maps, of photos, of, you know, antiques that, that I feel like are nowhere else to be found but other than in the Queen's Historical Society. So um, at this rate, I want to open up the room to anyone that has any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask Jason any questions that you might have about the Queen's Historical Society and what you saw today. Um, but um, I wanted to start off, how, um, what was the reaction of the community when this house was transported a mile from its original location to where it sits now? Say, I'm sorry, say, say one more time, I apologize. I'm sorry, I, um, I, I want to ask, you know, what is the community's reaction or feedback to having the house where it is currently sitting from where it originally yeah. sat? They, you know, every, everyone loves it. I, I mean, I think this is a better location um, because it's, uh, you know, the other location was more like open field and this is an actual park. The, the park is older. The park was here first. Weeping Beach Park goes back many, many years, way before the move in 1968. And so we were very grateful to the parks department and to the mayor's office at that time that they were able to accommodate us. And the house fits here just perfectly. I mean, when you when you visit uh, us, you 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 would assume that this place was here in this spot the entire time. 
Um, we are, we're right across the street also. We're like a hundred yards away, probably less from the John Bound House, which faces Bound Street. And that building has been there since 1661 in its location where, it's, where it currently is. And, uh, but we were moved, but where we are today, I mean, it's been, I mean, people really enjoy it here. It was, I mean, I think it was a very favorable thing because also one last thing to mention when it was moved here, the house was dilapidated because it had been abandoned for many years, but the exterior was still a very uh, good specimen of, of the type of architecture from its day. And that's why there was a committee form to, to save it. That's wonderful. And I love that you mentioned like it's it feels like it's always been here. So that's that's right. a good feel. Um, and the weeping beech tree in the backyard is just amazing. So I'm excited that's celebrating its 175th birthday, which is a, which is amazing in itself. Um, a great question we have in your archives. Do you have any information about Jamaica in the 1850s? We do. Uh, we have uh, a lot of photos of Jamaica from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And what we do have about Jamaica, we have a couple of books and we also have a ton of uh, paperwork uh, that's written on parchment paper from the 1850s, 1840s. And all of these are land, uh, land deeds and you know, estate sales, et cetera, real estate sales and, and wills and trusts and things like this. So we have a lot of that here in, in storage uh, and people could come and research them. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. How, with regards to the exhibit on the first floor, how often do you rotate the exhibits and, and how do you determine which exhibit to put up next? So we, we rotate it every uh, 12, 13 months and um, we basically decide uh, you know, depending upon, you know, we try not to repeat ourselves. So we try to do something new. We try to do something different. Uh, and actually we try to do something where we have a lot of stuff in our archive to, you know, so that we have the stuff for, at hand. Uh, we also join forces with other entities. If they have something that we don't have that can add to it. Um, and as uh, we also go by what the community would like, we try to stay away from programming that that we tend to find only interesting. We try to branch out to bigger things, out of the box ideas. But yeah, you know, we want to do out of the box, but also Queens relevant because it has to be relevant to the history of Queens. One prime example would be the exhibit that we had prior to this one, and that was the toy exhibit. It was an exhibit of all toys and games, which people loved. I mean, the 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 response to that this was pre pandemic. And people love this exhibit. But the cool thing was, it was I, I didn't, and I didn't even know this until the exhibit came along. Was that for a brief time, <coughs> Queens County was the toy manufacturing capital of the United States. So many different toys, like you know, were were created here. You know, the manufacturing companies were here. So these were all toys that were created in Queens, and and uh, and people just you know loved it. And and uh, we had a lot of these rare artifacts. On, on display. So the, this, but that's something that we typically wouldn't do. And so we're trying now to move away from like the rigid, you know, like, you know, old houses of Queens or this equipment and we're trying to, so the next exhibit that we're doing, we're, we're almost solidified in doing this. And that's uh, um, uh, the history of social justice in Queens County. Uh, so from the Flushing Remonstrance, because in Flushing is where religious freedom and tolerance was first created in 1657 by the Quakers and until today. So we have so much stuff here. You know, Martin Luther King spoke in Queens. Uh, President Kennedy came here during his campaign in 1960 to talk about affordable housing and unions. Uh, Malcolm X lived in Queens. Uh, at the time he was assassinated, he lived uh, right uh, by LaGuardia Airport. In uh, in East Elmhurst, um, and and so many and so many other things that that could be discussed. I mean, this is where one of the first multi-racial schools was opened was in Queens County. Uh, one of the first uh, uh, all-black women's school, the Flushing Female Association, was started here in Flushing, right behind the uh, AME Church. Uh, so that's uh, you know the, the first school to have people from all over the world, people from Asia, people from Latin America. The Flushing Institute, that first building that I showed early, uh, you know, for uh, you know people from from Northern Africa came here. This is like in pre Civil War, uh, they came here to study and to learn, and that's like very like unprecedented in 
in you know in the United States, but it happened here in Flushing. So there's a lot to talk about, and that's uh, one of the things that we are going to discuss in this upcoming exhibit. That's going to be a fabulous exhibit. <laughs> I mean, they always say Queens is the most diverse county, correct? Yeah. Am I saying? That? Yes. <laughs> because I, I like Queens, I'm going to say. Um, but no, that's wonderful. That sounds like a great exhibit. And you mentioned that it might, it, when exactly are you going to have that exhibit start? Uh, more, hopefully kind of by, I would say by October, November. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. We'll have to bring you back or we'll have to make a trip over there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so um, a few more questions. So how do you manage the archive room? Because you have the Hamilton drum to, you know, the cardboard photos. You know, how do you keep track of all of it? How does it stay, you know, in its prime um, sure. state? Well, all of these things are kept in the best possible archival conditions. We have an HVAC system in that room that keeps everything at a controlled temperature so it stays fresh and doesn't deteriorate because so many of the things in there are paper based. And, you know, it's like 90% of the items. And, you know, if it's not kept properly, it can just after a couple of years turn to dust. And as you can see, like with those photos I showed, see how like bright and clear and clean they were, they almost excuse me they almost look like reproductions but they're not they're original and that's because they're kept in this really like cool environment free of humidity and it's uh, uh we catalog everything we also uh have taken in a lot of new things and we're in the process of cataloging that as well um and that's how we, we keep track of everything and we have an online database here in-house where we keep track of everything everything gets a call number or an accession number uh, so that we can keep track of what we have so that if somebody comes in to do research we know where it is and where to find it for them that's great that's wonderful and you know how do you you know do you accept any archival items that are brought to you or is there a process in terms of submitting archival sure. items to QHS? well uh anyone is free to submit any item that they want here to qhs um, and then basically at our monthly board meeting, we take a vote whether to keep it or not. Um, and we keep most things because most of the things that we get sent here are relevant to Queens history. And some of them are like really rare, cool stuff that, you know, um, that, you know, we, we haven't seen before. Um, somebody sent us, I remember many months ago, uh, a, a collection of 20 issues of the of the Jackson Heights newspaper from 1919, and I didn't even know Jackson Heights. I mean, I wasn't surprised, but <clears throat> I didn't even know Jackson Heights had their own magazine slash newspaper in 1919. When it, which makes sense, that's when they were first developed. That's when they were open to the community. So, but they had it was called the Jackson Heights News, and even the library doesn't have that in their archive because it's so rare. And this woman found 20 or 25 issues in perfect condition from 1918 to like 1925 and sent it to us. So now we have that in our archive. So we get a lot of cool things here. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Um, uh, one, one last question. So do you partner with any local you know, organizations um, to bring you know, um, tour groups here or do you partner with um, well, now you're, you know, with our local organizations on what they have in terms of their archival items and how do you share or manage or loan these items, if any? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> we, uh, we, we do loan items uh, to other institutes uh, and we actually have items here that are from other facilities. For example, we actually have right, right here next to me, we have this, uh, pardon me, we have this uh, high tech scanner. This is a document scanner that we have on loan here to us from the Museum of the Moving Image. We're very grateful to them for letting us uh, use that to make reproductions. Uh, we have the silver set that you saw inside of the parlor. Uh, that belonged to the King family. That book comes from the King Manor in Jamaica, Queens. That's on loan to us too. Uh, so we have a, a couple of things here that are loaned to us, and then we do lend out other items. Uh, you know, and it's like it's per contract. You know, it's up for like a year, two years, whatever, and then uh, it's returned to us. But we do that. It's not often that it happens, but it does happen. That's great. It's wonderful. Um, I want to see if anyone else has any more questions for Jason. While we have him, we've had some good questions. Um, any takers? 
Well, I think this was such a wonderful talk, Jason. Thank you so very much for coming on and sharing a little snippet of, you know, the Queen's Historical Society. I think it's such a wonderful organization and I hope um, everyone gets a chance to visit it. I hope, you know, we, we got to visit it. Um, I know I made a, a stop um, on my way there and I think it's such a wonderful, um, you know, piece of history that's right there in the middle of Queens. And you would never know that you're in Queens when you step foot on the property because it's so well maintained. And like you said, it's very peaceful and it's a very calm area in, uh, in the homes at home. So it's very nice, um, but I want to thank you so very much. And I look forward to seeing you again and having you come back on hopefully. Um, but I did want to share some um, upcoming summer socials that we are planning at the university. So we are returning back to the Hamptons for our East End of Long Island event. So it's going to be on June 23rd. We're going to visit Clovis Point Vineyard and Winery. So we've been there a few years and we're glad to come back again. Um, so that's going to be on June 23rd from 6 to 9 p.m. And then the following morning on Friday, June 24th, we're going to head over to the Hampton Maid, which has been in business since the late 1950s. So we're super excited to return again. And then um, we're continuing our summer hour power series. So in um, July, we're going to have Dr. Chipola come and speak about all things Sicily. So the best kept secret, Sicily. So I hope you join us for that. And we're going to have a, uh, we're going to have the summer concert returns to St. John's. So we're going to have it on the Great Lawn. So we'll have um, a barbecue for our society members. So I hope you join us for that. And then August, we're going to head down to the Jersey Shore to an alumnus home for a barbecue. So it's been, uh, we're having fun planning all of these great summer events for you. And I hope you'll all join us for it. And I want to thank Jason again for his time and sharing thank a little so snippet uh, um, about the Queen's Historical Society. It's worth a, it's worth a trip, definitely yes. worth a trip. And I hope everyone makes it there. And I hope everyone has a wonderful summer. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much again. Thanks so much.